Welcome to Old Town Alexandria, Virginia. Travel across America with me. This is going to be such a historical, power-packed video. Sit back and enjoy all the information. And remember, you'll want to see the peanut soup. Yeah, I said peanut soup. There is so much to do in Old Town Alexandria. It is a nationally designated historic district that was founded in 1749. It is easily accessible and it's an escape on the Potomac River. It's only minutes from Washington, D.C. It deserves many, many days and we only had a few hours. Boy, did we get a lot in in those few hours and I want to share that with you now. Our second stop was at Christ Church. You know, the one that George Washington went to? Circa 7 1773. And while there, the curator told us all about the church, and I will be presenting a video on the church and the famous people that have darkened the doorway. The curator told us about the townhome of George Washington, and I did a short on that. You'll want to watch the short on the townhome. But the thing that we were headed for was Gadsby's Tavern, 1785, 1792. This place is so historic and so amazing. But why did we go there? Well, the reason we went there was to eat peanut soup. But boy, did we find a historical treasure. You see, this is the doorway to the restaurant. This doorway was returned to Gadsby's Tavern from the Metropolitan Museum by Charles Beatty Moore and installed in 1949 by the Alexandria Association. Wait till you see a picture of this doorway from the Civil War. I'll be showing you that soon. As we approached the door to go into the tavern to have lunch, there was a sign on the door that said that they were having a private party and we couldn't get in until 1.30, I think it was. So we'll have to wait. We're not just gonna have to wait to be seated. We've got like an hour and a half. What are we going to do? Waste some time? Well, it's not wasting time when you're in Alexandria. There is the museum next door. You have to pay admission to go beyond this point. Let's walk around a bit. There is a self-guided walking tour of Old Town Alexandria, and we did a good part of that. We made a beeline for the visitor center past Market Square and these beautiful fountains. We found the visitor center and this sign. Alexandria was named for the family of John Alexander, a Virginian planter who in 1669 acquired the tract on which the town began. By 1732, guys, that's almost 300 years ago. The site was known as Hunting Creek Warehouse and in 1749 became Alexandria, thereafter a major 18th century port. George Washington frequented the town, Robert E. Lee claimed it as his boyhood home, and from 1801 to 1847, Alexandria was a part of the District of Columbia and was later occupied by federal troops during the Civil War. We'll see a bit of all of this history. In 1946, Alexandria created the third historic district in the United States to protect its 18th and 19th century buildings and I am so glad that they did. You can ride the King Street Trolley from the Potomac River waterfront to the Metro. It's free, or you can rent these capital bikes, or you can do like we prefer to do, just hoof it down the streets. It's Alexandria's 275th birthday. Let's go in to the visitor center. But wait, look at this sign. I can't pass up a historical sign. So let's read what this says about this building. The Ramsey House, built circa 1724. That is 300 years ago this year. Crazy, isn't it? It is the oldest house in Alexandria, and it was owned by William Ramsey, a founder, trustee, and the first mayor of Alexandria in 1749. It was later occupied by his son, Dennis Ramsey, and his descendants. Interest in preserving the house was initiated by Edward C. Van Devater. Thank you, Edward. And as we see, it has been protected. The visitor center is open seven days a week, May through September, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. And the people inside. They were so nice and friendly and they did have water. It was so hot the day we were walking around there. That was really nice of them. Please be sure to subscribe. All right, so we're hoofing it back. We've got a little bit of time to spend. And okay, I found another sign. I had to walk across the street to see what it said. Here stood the home of Colonel John Fitzgerald, favorite aide de camp and bosom friend of Washington. Well, that's neat. Never thought of George Washington as having bosom friends, did you? Two more quick stops before we get to 
the Tavern Museum. That place was such a jewel, such a gem, such a hidden treasure. This is the Stabler Ledbetter Apothecary Museum and Shop. It's part of the self-guided tours. It's one of the city museums. You can tour this 18th century family-run pharmacy to see still intact herbal botanicals and ingredients that will transport you to Hogwarts. We didn't go in because we didn't have time, but I do want to go back and see this place for sure. It was founded in 1792. The Stabler Leadbeater Pharmacy operated on this site for 141 years, serving many early patriots. That's awesome. The shop is a unique reminder of the period when manufacturing, wholesaling, and dispensing of medicines were combined as a single enterprise of pharmacists in urban centers. This designation of Historic Alexandria Foundation Early Building Survey. You know what we found? Almost all the buildings in Alexandria had this sign on it because it's all historical. Then I found these signs on the street corners. They're informational historic signs. At this location on August 8, 1899, just before midnight, Benjamin Thomas was lynched. Oh my, you could spend hours, days, probably weeks, just walking around the town, reading all the signs and going into all the historic establishments that are open to the public. This sign on the other corner is talking about the electric railway, Alexandria's electric streetcar system, the Washington Alexandria and Mount Vernon Railway was established in 1892 between Alexandria and Mount Vernon. In 1896, the line extended into Washington, crossing the Long Bridge, where the 14th Street Bridge is today. And there's more on this sign? You'll have to go to Alexandria or pause the film to read more. American history abounds. Did I mention that it is Alexandria's 275th anniversary? Yet we've already found a building or two that is older than that. Here's a checklist of the museums that are part of the city tour. We're going to Gadsby's Tavern Museum. And we saw this area right at the corner and it's and we were thinking, what is this? So I walked down the steps. It says, in 1793, the Alexandria Common Council granted permission for John Wise to build an ice house underneath the corner of Royal and Cameron Streets as part of his construction of the new city tavern. This brick-lined ice well is a unique architectural feature, much larger than most urban ice wells. The well could store up to 62 tons of ice, enough ice to supply the tavern and even the citizens of Alexandria. How awesome is this? Blocks of ice harvested from the Potomac River were lowered through a hatch at the street level. The blocks were pounded into one large ice mass and covered with straw to limit melting. John Gadsby, who leased the tavern from John Wise in 1796, capitalized on ice as an amenity to the tavern, selling it to the public for eight cents per pound in 1805. Um, if he only knew how much we had to pay for a 10 pound bag of ice these days, he'd be smacking himself in the forehead. Ice for sale. The restoration of this historic ice well of Gadsby's Tavern Museum was completed August 28th, 2013. I am so excited and happy to see when people take care and take pride and invest their time, energy, and money in preserving our nation's history. Even if it is an ice well. How amazing. Subterranean ice well constructed in 1793 for John Wise's city tavern. You were standing on the location of the original ice well hatch where blocks of ice harvested from the Potomac River were lowered, stored, and used by the tavern. A brick-lined tunnel led from the tavern's basement to the ice well, allowing ice, chilling beverages, and perishable food items to be readily retrieved. Gadsby's Tavern, erected 1792. It was a popular resort and famous hostelry of the 18th century. Here was held in 1798, the first celebration of Washington's birthday, Happy birthday! In which he participated. And from its steps, Washington held his last military review and gave his last military order, November 1799. Wait till I take you to the capital of Maryland in Annapolis and you see the grand room and all the information about when Washington resigned all his posts and went back to be a gentleman farmer. But that's another video. Back to Gadsby's Tavern video. It is a registered National Historic Landmark. Well, of course it is. All right, Gadsby's Tavern Museum. It's owned and operated by the city of Alexandria, and I've mentioned that a few times. They have 
what was it? Eight different museums to choose from. And this is the one we chose because remember the peanut soup? It kind of led us here. Well, the idea of getting peanut soup led us here. The city of Alexandria gratefully acknowledges the generous gift of these two historic buildings by Alexandria Post Number 24 American Legion through the foresight of its membership, Gadsby's Tavern, was saved from destruction and preserved for posterity. Our community and nation salute these veterans and praise their patriotic concern for America's heritage. Okay, well, they said it a lot better. Well, I wasn't trying to write something for a plaque. I was just trying to convey to you how wonderful I thought it was that these people took care of these places. Welcome to Gadsby's Tavern Museum. Explore early American society through these two 18th century taverns. It's a 1785 tavern and a 1792 tavern. You can go to the shaded areas. That's what's open to the museum guest. And do you see the sign where it says ice well? That's that ice well we found on the outside of the building. Paid admission beyond this point. I think it was five bucks. Isn't that what it was? It was only five bucks. It's no big deal. Eight dollars for a guided tour. Five dollars just to get in. And they have a key to the city package. It's only twenty dollars to all Alexandria historic sites, water taxi discounts, and museum shop discounts. It's free admission for city of Alexandria residents or active duty military personnel and family of veterans. You can't beat this, can you? Just we gotta go. Let's go in, okay? What do Martha Washington's granddaughter and Thomas Jefferson have in common with respect to the tavern? You'll have to hang on because you will find out. And what does Thomas Jefferson have to do with this tavern anyway. Each room had tons of information on desk and they had, um, I don't know how to describe them, like laminated cards and laminated information of historical newspapers and articles. You could spend hours and hours in each room reading all the wonderful information that they have provided for guests to read. Everyone's asking if you have subscribed yet. How can you turn down these guys wearing powdered wigs? They want you to subscribe to my channel. Can you please subscribe? And if you have, thank you. Can you imagine wearing a powdered wig? Seems a bit weird, doesn't it? Private dining room. Oh, that looks yummy even though I know it's plastic, but doesn't that look good? I'm getting hungry because remember we were planning on lunch at noon and they said we couldn't get in until 1.30, so I'm starving. I think I could eat a plastic Cornish hen at this point almost. A square piano, please do not touch. An itinerant musician could travel with a square piano like this. The cabinet is set on a base, making it easy to disassemble and transport. Oh, that's smart. This five and a half octave piano was made circa 1806 by John Broadward and Son of London. The strings are hammered, not plucked like a harpsichord. Company records show pianos overtaking harpsichords in popularity by 1784. I bet that was a bit of trivia that you've been just waiting all your life to hear. The company, which still produces pianos today, is one of the oldest piano companies in the world. Press the button to hear the piano. I, I didn't press the button. Leave a comment below. Okay, I know you're going to say, well, why didn't you press the button? I don't know why I didn't press the button. I usually do press the buttons. And now we will be going into this assembly room. People of all ages attended a variety of entertainments in this large space. This tavern was one of many in Alexandria, enticing customers with entertainment and services. The first mention of this tavern in the local newspaper was in an ad for a dancing assembly in this very room. Dancing assemblies took place during the colder months for wealthier planter families wintering in the city. As the city expanded, purpose-built spaces replaced the need for rooms like this. This large room was subdivided and rented out as offices by the early 1800s. Look closely at the floor and you'll see the lines of nails marking where carpet was tacked down along the walls. They have this ring of documentation on more information if you want to know more and more about each room and what happened in this tavern. And then I saw this, mail a postcard. My thing is mailing postcards wherever we go, mailing them back to ourselves. I've even made a video talking about mailing yourself a postcard. You will want to go back into my playlist and find the video on mail yourself a postcard. What was really exciting about this is the postcard was free and you just leave your postcard in this box and they put the postage on there for you. You didn't even have to pay for postage. You didn't have to buy the postcard. And you didn't have to pay postage. And you didn't have to mail it. This was a triple hitter. And it was awesome. And you know what? I just got the postcard in the mail yesterday. 
That was so cool. Back to what I was saying. Mail yourself a postcard whenever you go somewhere fun. It's a great and inexpensive, and in this case, extremely inexpensive, as in costing nothing, souvenir. Now, this direction is to the 1792 City Tavern. I guess that means we were in the 1785 Tavern, and now we're crossing over into the 1792 Tavern. And the East Bed Chamber and the Ballroom. Wait till you see this ballroom. I hope you're enjoying our tour today. We've got so much more and we haven't even gotten to the restaurant and the peanut soup. Does that sound good to you or does that sound gross? You know, it sounded as gross as it did good. And uh, you'll have to wait till later in the video when we get in there and we order the soup. And I took my first bite to let you know what I thought of the peanut soup. Now, towards the ballroom. The 1790s brought changes as the United States took shape under the new Constitution. Many Alexandrians were optimistic about the future. The newly adopted Constitution provided political stability and the city's economy was booming. The Residence Act of 1790 promised the nation's capital would be built by 1800 along the Potomac River, including Alexandria in its boundaries. John Wise's financial success left him poised to take advantage of this opportunity. Remember, he's the one who started this tavern. In 1792, Wise funded the construction of this three-story brick tavern. He called it the City Tavern, a name reserved for the best in town. The City Tavern offered more amenities and privacy than the earlier tavern, distinctly catering to the upper class. I found this great sign beyond Alexandria in Alexandria as things were happening between 1788 and 1847. I might just pause the video here just for a minute so you can look at all these amazing, incredible historic events that happened in this time frame. And who's this chap? Well, can you guess? Are you guessing? Have you figured it out? Who would they put in this little room all by himself with this big gaudy gold frame? Who could this be? Well, of course, it's a portrait of John Gadsby, 1833. Towards the end of Gadsby's over 40 years in hospitality, this portrait was painted by his grandson. Boy, grandson, John Gadsby's Chapman, you're a pretty good painter. The famous American painter completed it in 1833 for his grandfather's final business, the National Hotel in Washington, D.C. Oh, my. So he's not just some guy painting by number? He's a famous American painter? Boy, I'm gonna have to brush up on that. If you've heard of him, tell me in the comments below. If you made me feel bad for not knowing, it's all right, just let me know. I'm humble, I'm learning this stuff every day, and I'm just wanting to share it with you. While only here 12 years, Gadsby's skill and lucky timing left a lasting impression. Once Gadsby arrived in Alexandria from England, he managed a tavern near the waterfront. In 1796, he leapt at the opportunity to lease this more refined tavern. In 1808, Gadsby sold his lease and moved to Baltimore. Speaking of Baltimore, I'll be taking you to Fort McHenry. You know, Francis Scott Key, Star Spangled Banner. And I caught some photographs of the key bridge. You know, the one that pff, got hit by that boat. I got some pictures from Fort McHenry of that crazy thing that happened not so long ago. There has been archeological work done on this site, trying to find more stuff. Fragments of material, culture, and brief mentions in newspapers can help to envision the fashionable amenities offered at the City Tavern. Archaeology revealed a variety of artifacts connected to serving alcohol and dining. Having on hand a large stock of good liquors, as many ads for taverns claimed, was key to a successful business. Under Gadsby, Moses, the enslaved wine steward, oversaw an extensive wine cellar valued at $2,000 imported from England. Pearlware dishes were a common, inexpensive tableware. These dishes were fashionable, but easily replaced by a cost-conscious tavern keeper. And here's a few items that they found. So amazing. A shell edge plate ceramic shard and bottleneck fragment excavated from the courtyard. Okay, I was wondering about this ladder and it had this little sign dangling on it. So I thought, well, you know what? I better take a picture of this ladder. And then I saw this sign on the next wall, right through the doorway. Remember the ladder? Yeah, I remember it. I just took a picture of it. Musicians used it to reach the gallery during dancing assemblies. What? They would remain until the ladder was brought back out and they climbed down for a break. Okay, so a ladder was put there, they climbed up somewhere, and then the ladder was taken away. 
Ah, uh, that's not cool. View the musician's gallery in the ballroom. Don't miss the furnished bedchamber down the hall. Okay, I won't. We're going, we're going. All right, I'm looking up. See, that's where the ladder goes. Do you see me in the mirror? Look at that old mirror. Look at this room. Changes in the 19th century. The city hotel struggled to compete in a changing landscape. Here's the musician's balcony. It became an odd feature in the central room. It is an odd feature. With larger new hotels opening nearby, the city tavern known as the City Hotel needed to change to keep pace. By the 1850s, this ballroom was no longer attracting major events, so it was subdivided into three well-appointed suites with parlors. In 1878, a large addition was added to the back of the City Hotel, and it offered both gas, lighting, and water closets, the indoor plumbing of the time. But wait till you learn what happened in this room. There's where the musicians sat. That is what they used the ladder for, to get up there. The finest celebrations of Alexandria and Washington, D.C. were held in this room. You're not gonna believe some of these things I'm about to tell you about. Designed to entertain on a grand scale, this space contributed to the tavern's fame. In 1798 and 99, George Washington attended birthday celebrations in his honor, known as the Birth Night Ball. I think I mentioned that earlier, didn't I? I thought I did. Music floated from the musician's gallery as guests danced in long lines called sets. Later, Thomas Jefferson toasted to the prosperity of Alexandria during his inaugural banquet in March of 1801. What? Yes. All right, remember I was talking about Martha Washington and Thomas Jefferson and what they had in common? Well, I'm gonna put it together. Nellie Kustis, Martha Washington's granddaughter, wrote to a friend describing the 1798 birth night ball. So she was there at uh, George Washington's birthday party. My grandparents and self went up to Alexandria to attend the celebration of the birth night. The room was crowded. There were 25 or 30 couples in the two first sets. We danced until two o'clock a.m. I went with Mrs. Potts to her house and sat up until five. Well, I guess she was a night owl. And then, that was Nellie. Now we got the Thomas connection. Events like the inaugural banquet were a public pageant, often described in the detail by the newspapers. The Alexandria Times on March 16, 1801 stated, The company who partook of entertainment was the largest ever known at a public dinner prepared at any tavern in this town, and the style and elegance with which it was furnished at so short a notice reflect the highest credit on the taste and industry of Mr. Gadsby. Here, here, Mr. Gadsby, you did good. They have recreated balls and celebrations in this room. Wouldn't that be fun to see? Uh, be kind of fun to dress up to, wouldn't it? How do I dance to this music? They even tell you how you can dance. They give you a whole list of directions on how to dance, so if you want to know how to dance, you can uh, freeze the video and try and read this card. I can smell food. It's almost time to get to lunch. I can smell the food because it's coming up through the floor, through the vents. I can smell the food. It's making me even hungrier. Please be sure to subscribe. We've got a few more places to see. And it's it's not time. They're not open yet. But smelling that food is like, that's torture. Remember when I mentioned the doorway and the Civil War and the connection? Well, here's that connection. At the beginning of the Civil War, Alexandria was quickly occupied by Union forces. Lacking the amenities needed to be used as a hospital, the hotel began to cater to guests visiting Union hospitals and prisons nearby. The tavern keeper, Samuel Heffelbauer, also operated a secret bar. Shh, shh, and his profits skyrocketed before he sold the lease to Robert McClure. McClure hosted the governor of the restored government of Virginia, Francis H. Pierpont, who used the ballroom suites as his headquarters in 1863. The hotel survived the war, but like many businesses in Alexandria, was never as profitable as in Gadsby's time. Soldiers were attracted to the building and its connection to George Washington. Here, the first district volunteers pose in front of the city hotel. You know, it's kind of funny. <laughs> I just thought about that city hotel thing. My stepdad, he always called the jail the city hotel. That was free. And remember, this was that whole doorway thing that I'd mentioned earlier, that the doorway was returned to the Gadsby Tavern from the Metropolitan Museum by Charles Beatty. Moore. Thanks, Mr. Moore. Okay, curious as I am, I went over to the windowsill. I was thinking, what is this? This is really unusual and it must be important because they have it on display. Remember the ice well? When the city tavern was built in 1792, it included an underground ice well that could store over 60 tons of ice for the business. Remember, we talked about that earlier. 
showed you where it was outside on the corner. In the winter, enslaved people cut ice from the frozen Potomac River and brought it to the ice well for storage. This ice served many purposes from cooling beverages to making a new dessert of the day. Ice cream, ice for sale. Remember, I tried to read that sign earlier. Visit the restored ice well at the corner of North Royal and Cameron Streets for more information about this architectural feature. We did, we already told everybody about it. But what about this ice cream thing? Ice cream took time to create. Flavorings including strawberry, parmesan, what? Oysters, asparagus were crafted before the freezing process began, before serving ice cream was molded into fanciful shapes for display. So those are little ice cream molds. Are they trying to say that they had parmesan, oyster, or asparagus ice cream? Somebody tell me in the comments if I'm reading this right. Oh, please tell me I'm not reading this right. The strawberry sounds great. Parmesan, maybe. Oyster and asparagus ice cream. We had garlic ice cream one time when we were in Gilroy, California, the garlic capital of the world. Oh my, one bite, my stomach was screaming. Um, so I'm not a big fan of anything but just normal ice cream. This room is amazing. And now we are going to go over to the furnished bed chamber. This hotel room, one of 14 in the city tavern, is furnished based on Gadsby's 1802 inventory. Keep the room tidy. Don't touch anything. Your oils and your fingers are going to damage stuff. Keep your hands back. This is the east bed chamber, as I said, and with more of this upper class traveling, this room was well appointed to meet their needs. While the rooms were still not private, the beds were. <laughs> Okay. And the curtains could close for privacy and protection from insects or cold. This also afforded a bit more privacy for the increased number of women traveling. As the food on the table suggests, room service is one of the number of amenities offered. John Davis declared in 1801, I found elegant accommodations at Gadsby's Hotel. It is observable that Gadsby's keep the best house of entertainment in the United States. Thomas Jefferson, a hotel guest? So Thomas Jefferson slept here? Why didn't he just hang out with George down, down, the, down the block? Oh, I know. George died in 1799, and this is 1801. Okay. While Gadsby's hotel records have not survived, Thomas Jefferson's account has. On January 3rd, 1801, he noted paying Gadsby $5.50 for dinner and lodging, as well as 75 cents as a tip to the servants, a period term for enslaved people. Jefferson had been staying in Washington, D.C., awaiting the House of Representatives' vote to break the tie in the Electoral College. I have a whole video talking about that. He was tied. Do you remember who he tied with for president and then what happened and how Jefferson became president? You'll have to go back and watch one of my other videos to know, unless you already know. On January 2nd, Jefferson traveled from D.C. to visit widow Martha Washington and pay his respects at the tomb of George Washington. He probably had New Hampshire Senator John Langdon with him which explains why his final bill was higher than the norm. What, the New Hampshire guy charged a lot to the room or what? But remember I'd said that George was dead and so he couldn't be sleeping down the block at the town home because George wasn't there anymore. Jefferson spent six tense days in mid-February anticipating the results as citizens began questioning if the Union would survive. The deadlock finally broke with a 36th ballot and Jefferson was declared the president. He returned to the city tavern in March. Visit the ballroom across the hallway to see why. We already were in the ballroom to see why. It's because this is where he had his inaugural dinner. All right, one more area to see. The dormer sleeping rooms upstairs. The dormer sleeping rooms are part of the older 1785 tavern. So we're going back over there and we're going to go to the top floor. Taverns offered no privacy, simply the promise of a place to lie down. Tavern keepers were required by law to offer overnight lodging. The price was regulated, set at 20 cents per night. At 50 cents, the main meal was more expensive than the accommodations. While these amounts may not sound like much, the average daily wage was a dollar to a dollar fifty, making travel costly. As we were going back down to leave and finally go get something to eat, I had seen this carved out pig in that assembly room and I was wondering what that was. Was that the assembly room? I don't know. The room where the postcards were? They had this pig there, and I was like, what is the deal with this pig? Meet Toby, the wonderful pig of knowledge. This pig, this learned pig, could spell, do math, and read minds? I bet. Although there is no record of a show in this room, newspaper ads described a learned pig who performed at McKnight's Tavern across the street in 1801. Explore the room and don't miss your chance to pose or act out your own performance with Toby, the wonderful pig of knowledge. 
Oh, that seems so silly. Let's go downstairs. Let's go next door. Let's go through that historic door and let's have some lunch. It's time to pass through the historic doorway. I am so hungry. Please wait to be seated. I've been waiting for hours. Let's go. We're inside finally. Isn't this place awesome? Did I tell you this part that George ate here? The Founding Fathers worked up a real appetite gaining our country's independence, so chances are they also knew a thing or two about where to eat. Come dine where Presidents Washington, Jefferson, Adams, Madison, and Monroe ate. Isn't that really, really the coolest thing? I think so. I'm excited. And this place is so beautiful. I love it. Water goblets, pewter chargers, old wooden tables and chairs. It's a classic tavern. The server left us with a historical paper on the Gatsby's Tavern and the menu. Oh my, the first thing I see, that's what I was hoping to get. I think that's what I'm going to get. Where's the soup? Oh, it's on the other side. Surrey Company peanut soup. A cup or a bowl? Roasted peanuts simmered in fresh chicken stock with garlic and ginger. Oh, that makes it sound pretty good, doesn't it? Look at this menu. I don't know what to pick. Oh yeah, I do, I do, I do. Let's start off with a bowl of peanut soup. Um, it's, uh, it's good. I could do without the peanuts. I know that sounds dumb. Well, between the two of us, we polished it off. We ordered the Chesapeake Bay Lump Crab Cake served with hand-cut fries and sweet corn salad. This was one of the best crab cakes I'd ever eaten. This is Virginia, isn't it? Aren't you supposed to eat crab cakes in Maryland? We're close enough. And we also got the ale-battered crispy cod served with handmade cut fries and coleslaw. Some of the best crispy cod we've ever had. And look at the prices, exceedingly reasonable. Flip-flops on the ground. And classic road trip. I hope you're looking forward to the video on Christ Church. And you'll see more on George Washington's pew and other famous people that pass through the doors of this historic church. Thank you for sharing my travel videos. And thank you for watching. And if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And if you love history and information about our nation, I want to recommend you go back to watch From the Poor House to the White House and the man who followed in the footsteps of Abraham Lincoln. It's Andrew Johnson. Thank you.